Hi, my name is Kenneth. Um, I am Danish, so I'm one of these happy people. We even have happy sockets in Denmark, as you can see. I work for a small company called Intel. Uh, we do chips, software, etc. And my job is to make sure that we have this awesome platform called the web and it's always improving and serving like the needs of the community. Um, so I work on Chrome and I also work on a lot of specifications. So I'm basically working on the web platform. So um, we're here today to talk about smart devices. But what is it that makes a device smart? Well, you can have something like this touch thing, like a small smart lamp here, but is it really smart if it's complicated or s uh, slow to use? So take a like I want to turn on my light. First, I have to unlock my phone. I have to find that app. I have to wait for it to load. I have to turn, and then I can turn on the light. That's not really smart, is it? Like if it has to take multiple seconds for doing something, which you could do faster before. So smart devices need to solve real issues. They also need to be there when you need them. And they need to be easy to use and have low friction. I don't want to download an app. I just want to do stuff. That is like how people are. But we are developers. We always think about like, hey, I need to do something. But like, think, keep the user in mind. People want things and they want it now. If you think about a future where everything is connected, like your, your radio, your lamps, etc., this is not going to scale with apps because you will have like 100 different apps on your home screen. It will take longer finding what you need. So we need another solution. Too many icons, that's, that's not it. You'll lack the overview. And then again, you'll get all these updates updating all the time, even for apps and services you never use. Let's look at some different scenarios. Some of these services, apps, you could use for day, uh, everyday things, like turning on the light, turning on the... Um, your radio, some you use once in a while, maybe you want to know like how is the temperature in my basement, how is the humidity. And some you use like once in a while, like maybe, oh, I'm in Amsterdam, I want to pay for my car. But like maybe I'm first back in Amsterdam five years later, so maybe I don't really want to install something for such a use case. So maybe there's a better model. Well, we work on the web, and there are other talks at this conference about something called progressive web apps, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But the web is great for these, like, it has very low friction, so it's good for these, like, one-time usage. Um, and we want them to be, uh, like, handy. You want these apps to be there when you need them. So if you have one of these, like, services you need on a regular basis, maybe you can add it to your home screen. That is possible with progressive web apps. Also, with these progressive web apps, you don't have the clutter, like the URL bar that you have from the web. So you get like the best of both worlds. You have these like f uh, low friction um, experiences, just putting in a URL. And, and then you can like add them to your hope screen so you don't get no clutter. You get the icons. And most importantly, they're kind of safe because the web is designed to be safe. Uh, everything lives in a sandbox. So it's kind of nice that you know if you type in a URL that you don't need to be afraid of what's going on. You don't need to approve all kinds of uh, different permissions like, hey, can I please read your contacts? Because like, I just want to pay for parking. Uh, but we're talking about devices today, so we need to look at, and these normally live outside of the sandbox, so how do we connect to these? Can we do that? Yeah, the web can do that. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that we work in this industry and we like talking about technology, whether it's React, Angular, or how to solve things. But like, if you think about the user, they don't care. Companies, they don't care. They just want to connect stuff. It should just work. So today we're going to look at two different technologies. I'm sorry if this is going a bit quick, but I originally planned to have 45 minutes, so now I've got 25, so it's a bit short. <laughs> so we'll talk about Bluetooth and uh, USB. So that second logo there, that's called USB. Um, so what are the advantages of Bluetooth? Well, Bluetooth is everywhere. It's widely used. Uh, with the new like Bluetooth 4, you have something called Bluetooth Smart or called Bluetooth Low Energy, so it uses less battery. And most importantly, it's wireless. It's also cheap, relatively cheap, it's easy to use and it has a functionality called beacon functionality. It means that devices can announce that they're around. 
like you've probably seen some a few beacons out around today. Um, and uh, but there are of course also some downsides to technologies like it's security. Like you p maybe n maybe you don't want like Bluetooth in a hospital because it might interfere with other uh, machinery you have there. Um, as it's just radio waves, it would be possible to find out what's going on because it's just in the air, so you could wiretap it. Uh, of course, you would probably try to encrypt what you have there, but it's a possibility. Uh, devices are normally not powered, so you have to have an you have to have plug them into like a power plug, or a power socket, um, or they have to be powered by a battery. And of course, stability. Like if there's a lot of Bluetooth devices around, well, that will affect the, the stability of the connection, and of course, the speed. So here's like one example of what you can do with Web Bluetooth today. So this is using Web Bluetooth. You see, it connects to the uh, one of these lamps and connects you control it. So these things actually work today, and Web Bluetooth is shipping on Android on Chrome already. So this is uh, the specification: Web Bluetooth, uh, super powerful, cool new API. I really encourage everyone who has a little bit of interest. Take a look at it. It's actually really, really easy. So it's based on Bluetooth 4, so this is n the low energy part of it. So this is not the classic. This is not what you use for connecting to your keyboard or your mouth, your mouse or your headset. Um, this is a s very simple um, protocol called GAT. It's called Generic Attributes. It's easy to use. It uses all the modern web uh, APIs like Promises. Um, um, support is not perfect yet. Uh, it's not so well supported on Windows, um, but it works okay for Linux for me and Mac, and especially it works really well on Android. And usually when you want to connect to these devices, you, you want to do that with your phone. Um, Web Bluetooth only works on over HTTPS, and that's because of security concerns. It also requires a gesture. You don't want just to go to... We want to keep the web safe. Like I was talking about this like sandbox model before. You don't want to surf to a web page and suddenly it's connecting to one of your devices at your home. So it, it requires a user gesture, like a connect button, like you have to push it physically. So uh, here I'm just showing like how to connect to a heart rate monitor. So you see a click, pops up a dialog, you sele select the device, and there you go. As easy as that from a user point of view. Um, I don't know if you can read this. I hope so. Um, it's trying to show you how easy it is to connect. So navigate the Bluetooth request device. You can pull in some filters. Here I'm doing a service called battery service. When that fulfills, because it's an async API, you can do things, or you can cast errors. It might be a bit different if you have like existing Bluetooth devices that might use these like UUIDs, but it's really, really simple. Some of these uh, devices have optional services. Um, so if there's a service you want to use, if it's, if it's there, you need to list this as an optional service. Otherwise, you cannot connect to it if it's available. So here I'm searching for a device called a Kenneth Robot. And I wanna, if it has a battery service, I want to use it. So I need to put that in optional services. So le let's have a look at like, how Bluetooth low energy works. Uh, you have this called a GAT profile. A profile contains uh, different services with different characteristics. Now you're JavaScript developers, a lot of you. So the way you can think of this is like a service is kind of like an object, uh, which has like a collection of properties. And these properties are the characteristics. So this could be like a bool or a string. Uh, but of course, as people, they want to keep things small and tiny. They often end up using a characteristic like uh, maybe like a byte array, like a uint, eight array and stuff different values in the same property. So what I'm doing here is like I connect when I get my device, like my battery service, I can then connect to the get service, and then I'll get the server back. From that, uh, I can then, from the service, I can get characteristics. So remember the characteristics, like the properties. Here I'm asking for battery level. When I get that back, I can, for instance, read a value. And that's as everything is async, because you have promises, I get dot then, and I get like a battery percentage. These are often like encoded like they're like, like unsigned in eight values, unsigned in 32, 
depending on, that's, that's how Bluetooth works. You can also write really easily. So if you have a device you want to like set the color, like I have this device here, or it used to have be connected to a uh, color LED, you could actually change the color from, from web Bluetooth. Um, so you see it's kind of the same here. I'm, I'm sending like a reset energy uh, thing. So I just generate the UN8 array with a value of one, and I just write value, and it just works. Really, really easy. But of course, normally you want to get like updates, like if it's a temperature sensor. You want to get update every time the temperature changes. And the way you do that is that you need to, first of all, when you get the characteristic, you need to start notifications, and then add an event listener. So here I'm adding an event listener on a characteristic value change, and then I just pick out the value and do something with it. So really, really easy. But uh, when you do these services, uh, you still have the problem that people have to discover your service, just like with the app thing, like people have to go to the app store and install something. And I mentioned before that Bluetooth supports something called broadcasting. So you can send out data. And uh, Google, they standardize something they call the Eddystone. It's a way that you can send out data in a pre-formatted format. And one of the most important part of it is what they call the physical web, it means that a, a device can broadcast a URL. So that fi fits really, really well with how the web works. So it means that like I connected this device, people have to who has like the physical or nearby uh, enabled on the phone should actually see this uh, device. I don't remember exactly what it's called. Um, so I see it on mine, it says uh, accelerometer and gyroscope sensor data. So that will actually be my app and I can click on it uh, and actually connect to it. So let me just do that. It will start up my, my app and from here, the user gesture, I click on connect. I connect to my device and if everything is working, it should start showing data. It's probably very small, but I can show it afterward. So you see that it's, it's really, really, really easy. And that's a really good way of making discoverability. So let's take a look here. This is actually uh, something they're using in London. Um, this is called Proxama. I believe it's the bus company. So you at a bus stop, they will have a small beacon, Bluetooth beacon inside the bus stop. Uh, and it will like broadcast like the schedule and et cetera. So you can click on that and you'll get like all the route information, et cetera. Super cool and useful. And of course, this can also scale to like payment apps like I talked about earlier. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just putting out a link here. I'll share my slides on Twitter later so you can follow me and uh, you can have a look uh, yourself. It's really easy to get started with. But I mentioned I would also talk a bit about USB. So now you might be wondering, well, wow, we have Bluetooth. Why should I care about USB? Uh, well, it's also widely in use. It's very cheap. And the cool thing here is it's actually cabled and thus more secure. Because like, well, it's not, there's nothing in the air. Um, it's pretty stable and it's very fast. Like you can really do fast things over USB. And the cool thing is like, like this device, like I'm using Bluetooth now, but I could have used like web USB. It actually gets powered over the cable. And you can say that the disadvantage is that it's cabled depending on your use case. USB has no radio interference. Uh, and if, for instance, if imagine that you're a big company, you have machinery you want to control. Uh, it might be pretty cool to go into the factory, uh, plug in my USB cable, and actually control the machinery. I could change settings. But like, hey, that's a security risk. But the cool thing about USB is that you could have uh, that lock behind the hatch. So that you actually would need like a physical key. So you see there are kind of different use cases. And as I've said in the beginning, like users and companies, they don't care what technology you use. They just want things to work. So here I'm showing like uh, one example. Uh, I'll probably have to click on it. This is showing uh, actually this device. It's, it's running uh, an operation system called Zephyr um, and it has a JavaScript runtime. So what I did is that I made it possible that when I connected over USB, it will actually open up my browser using WebUSB and I'll be able to program this device using my browser. So let's just have a look at that. Um, I'm not sure if there's sound, but I can explain it. 
so you see it's currently not powered. Um, so I take my device, plug it in. Uh, it will boot. So when it's booting, uh, I should see a dialog. Uh, so now it's booted. You see a dialog like web USB detected. If I click on that, it will load uh, uh, my demo app here. It has a console where I can program JavaScript. Uh, I'm showing that it, it got the web USB permission. Uh, I can now, like, I'm just showing some JavaScript code. I can click on run, and it will actually transfer that to the device and run it. So this is using the temperature sensor. So I'm pressing run, and it should start showing the temperature. Yeah. Now, just to show that it's actually live, uh, I'm changing uh, my samples. So I just made a lot of samples. So I'm changing to RGB. We will change the color of the light. And you see that works as well. So just like sh I'm just trying to show like the power of, of these technologies. This is like super cool. But of course, it's up to you to find out like what you want to create. <laughs> and now I need to click on my computer for this to continue. Maybe I if I click here, yeah. So it, it's like I said, this example shows a smart device running JavaScript. Uh, it shows the bootstrapping, like showing up the dialog, which I can click on. And it shows the device being powered over USB. USB is different than uh, Bluetooth. It has three different modes of transferring things, uh, bulk, interrupt, and isochronous. Bulk is uh, the fastest, but they have no guaranteed timing. So you just try to. Uh, send a lot of data in a bulk. Uh, this is very common for printers uh, and serial connections. Interrupt, they have a guaranteed maximum latency, so this would be good like for a mouse and keyboard. You don't want it to stall a bit while you're typing. It should always type. <laughs> and isochronous is, is kind of like a broadcast. Like If you don't receive the data, if it's, it doesn't matter. It's like just do your best attempt. Um, when you're working with web USB, um, on the device itself, you can set a few headers. Uh, in the beginning, this was a requirement. It's not any longer. Um, but this creates like further security and restrictions. Like you can restrict which web pages can actually access this device. And of course, to get that dialogue you saw in the beginning, uh, you need to do this, uh, that dialogue. There's a few uh, issues, especially like on Linux. Uh, you have this modem manager, so if you're using a CDC or something, a serial port, uh, well, you probably need to get it blacklisted. Um, I have been complaining to the, uh, the maintainers of Linux, but yeah, let's see if they get that fixed. On the, but if you have a product and you, you want this fixed, especially on Chrome OS, it's not a problem. Just submit a patch to Chrome OS and they merge it immediately. Uh, on, on Windows, there's also a f you need a few extra descriptors. And if you're using something earlier than win Windows 10, uh, it's kind of difficult getting working. Uh, Microsoft, they kind of wanted to earn some money at that point, it seemed, <laughs> and have signed drivers. Similar to uh, web, um, Bluetooth, this is a promise-based API. It's slightly different because USB is different. Uh, now I'm showing it with promises, but as JavaScript is getting better all the time, you can also use with the latest features and latest browser, you could use async await instead, so it becomes a bit easier to read. Request a device, you open it. This is like specific to how USB works, like you select the configuration, you claim an interface. No other app on the, the computer can claim that interface then. And then you can transfer something out. It's like sending something, like writing, and you can transfer in. It's kind of like reading. So this is kind of like a master-slave system. Everything is controlled from the computer. Uh. This works in Chrome today on Linux, Mac, and Windows. It's behind a flag, so you need to turn that on, or you need to use what's called an origin trial. It means that you can request a token from Google, which you can put in your HTML file, and for a certain amount of time, it will just work on your site. Uh. But then, after a while, you need to request a new token until they ship it. There's also a nice article online. So, yeah, that was kind of short. I actually planned a lot more, but uh, I don't know how much time I have. I still have 10 minutes. You want to see more? <laughs> Let's uh, move to another representation then, my, my full version. <laughs> 
so. Okay, let's just. Uh. It looks really similar. <laughs> See, here I'm talking about like uh, service workers. <laughs> Whoa, but there's more. Well, <laughs> uh, so you. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of companies, um, wh when they're doing these devices or like using IoT, they, they really uh, they, they need to track products. Like a lot of companies, they track products. It might be like mails, it might be your groceries. So one, one of the ways to do this is using something called like barcodes. Um, it's very, very common. And that is also coming uh, to the web. Um, sometimes a beacon, like I showed you before, might be the best solution. And sometimes it's not. Uh, it might even be that you want to use NFC tags, which requires you to have a physical connection. But in many places, barcodes and QR codes, they work really well. And they're very cheap, because you can just make a sticker or you can print it. And in Chrome, uh, Google is working on a new barcode reader API. It's actually part of something called shape detection. So this will actually scale to other things, like finding people in pictures or live stream. Um, so just to show you how easy this is, like you can create a barcode detector, you can put in an image or you can have a stream instead, and then every time you find something, it might find more than one. You can iterate over your barcodes, you get the bounding box, and then you, for instance, could get like the, the barcode itself, and you can look that up in a database or something like that. Really, really cool. Sometimes you might want to really have a physical connection. You can think about this like I'm going into an elevator. So the first thing the elevator does is it will show me like all kind of information about the venue or where I'm going using like Bluetooth. It will just show up my phone. But I, I, I got this like a sign in because like I want to go to this uh, third floor with this company I'm visiting. Maybe I'm going for an interview. And it will just generate uh, like a code on my phone. So I can use my phone for for touching a reader and suddenly it will bring me to the right floor. So they're all kind of use cases. So if you need a physical connection, NFC is really cool. Uh, I'm showing a very simple example here, like how you can push something to NFC. You see it takes a JSON array, so there's uh, like a JSON object, so you get data. Now I'm just pushing a URL, uh, very simple. Um, you can do this like more complicated. Um, you can watch for when, I don't know if you know how NFC works. NFC, uh, normally when you talk about tags, these are passively powered. Like, there's, n there's no battery in inside. But when you bring your phone, uh, like an active device, close to it, that will send out like a field, which will actually power up the device, and at the same time, read or write. So what I'm doing here is that when that happens, on watch, I will check whether it's empty. If it's empty, I just write something to it. I'm just writing JSON. I'm just writing my name, first name, Kenneth. If not, if it's not empty, I'll try to read what is on it. So like first time I, I tab it, it will write Kenneth. Second time I'm going through the data, I'm looking for a record of type JSON, and I can print out that first name. Uh, or like even more complicated records, like opaque, I can even write like an image on one of these NFC tags as well. So we worked on an API that makes it like really easy doing these things. And this is uh, inside Chrome now, behind a flag on Android. Uh, yeah, even uh, the inventor of the web, so, so Tim Berners-Lee got pretty excited when I was showing this to him. <laughs> so it's just a cool picture. <laughs> but. Uh, Sometimes you want to connect to these other devices in order to control things or get input. So maybe like a sensor. So sensors are super cool. 
Um, they might be in a device like this, or they might be in your phone. So especially in this day where people are talking about web VR, you might, you might, it might be a control like this with a sensor inside, a gyroscope, accelerometer, and wouldn't it be cool using these things from the web? Um, as I said, my phone already has that. So um, we've been looking at creating an API um, that allows you to connect to your local device sensors, like on your phone, your computer, your laptop, or remote ones, uh, like in a Bluetooth device. Um, so we have the generic sensor API. And there are a lot of other APIs for the specific sensor, like gyroscope, magnetometer, accelerometer, ambient light sensors, and much more. We even have orientation sensors now. So just to show you how it currently works, you can generate something like a accelerometer. You can give it a frequency. And then every time there's a change, you'll get notified. And then you can turn it on and turn it off. This is a more advanced example. I'm showing that I have a gyroscope. Every time I get a new value, I calculate the norm. This is a bit of math. Uh, and then at the end, I'm calculating the, the I'm trying to calculate the angle. Uh, you might know that a gyroscope it gives you angular velocity, so you need to use the time. So you need to find the time difference in order to get the angle. So the angle is always relative to your start position. Um, I can show, uh, if people are interested, I can show that later. So this is uh, pretty cool, and I recorded a video of myself. Uh, I got the daydream, the Android daydream thing, uh, and it has a very nice controller, so I tried to hook that up and expose its data as a generic sensor API. So I'm just showing that right here. So this is my small demo app. I select uh, Daydream Viewer, and suddenly I can control it using web Bluetooth. Pretty cool, and this guy tells me that I need to get moving. <laughs> but we're almost there. So that's it. <laughs> Pretty well timed. <laughs>